Welcome to this evening's Sips and Bites presentation. As a public university, we pursue a mission of excellence in education and research. We have a mandate to disseminate knowledge and to foster a dialogue with the public through events such as this one. The Robert Mandavi Institute strives to provide the public with insights into food and beverage innovations. We focus on programs with the departments of viticulture and Enology and food science and technology. And tonight's program is particularly interesting because it links the beverages studied in those two departments. Before we begin, let me mention that your questions are very welcome. Please use the Q&A tool to submit your questions. Our moderator and guests will try to get to as many as possible through the program and at the end of the program as well. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, Professor Glenn Fox. <clears throat> Glenn is the Anheuser-Busch Endowed Professor of Malting and Brewing Sciences here at UC Davis. He has published more than 100 peer-reviewed book chapters and journal articles and is a leading authority on brewing, malt, and beer quality. In 2018, he was elected fellow of the Institute of Brewing and Distilling for his contributions to the malting and brewing industries. Glenn joined the faculty at UC Davis in 2019. He'll be leading tonight's presentation on disrupting the beer wine paradigm with a guest from the San Diego Brewery. Glenn. Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's great to be here again. Uh, it's nearly 12 months since I sat in uh, and moderated a Sips and Bites event, uh, and what a year it's been. Uh, I'm really pleased that we've managed to organize this event, uh, and it really is challenging some old paradigms, uh, but this is what the craft industry is about. The craft industry is about innovation, and it does challenge many paradigms uh, to keep innovating, bringing new beers to market. Historically, people might think this is, well, People might think this is a little odd that we're going to actually be mixing beer and wine. Um, historically, beer is open to uh, being friends with other beverages. And back in the 1800s, people would mix uh, beer and other drinks. Uh, they were called Radlers. Uh, certainly in Germany, that was a style of beer. And it just made the beers a little sweeter. And I'm not sure if other people have tried this, but I certainly like a Guinness and champagne together. It's, that's a black velvet, and that, that is a very nice drink. Again, you might be trying to wrap your head around the different flavours there, but it's such a smooth uh, taste. It's not harsh in any way. Uh, so this is where we're coming from, but the level of, of ingenuity that we're going to be talking about tonight is actually not just a case of getting two different beverages together and mixing those together. This is actually a, a design production system, uh, and again, using things that we probably don't think are typical just for even in brewing. Um, we talk about barrel aging, uh, which is not a common thing we, we do in brewing, but it is done. So to help me through this discussion tonight, well, we've got Jeremy Grinke from The Brewery. Uh, and as Andrew introduced, uh, Jeremy and The Brewery are down in San Diego. And Jeremy has an interesting background himself, um, have been a part of the wine industry and uh, in Central California or Central Coast California. And now he was involved in setting up the brewery, uh, part of the brewery and, and certainly leading this new innovation in, in merging these beverages together. Uh, and it's not the sort of thing that a lot of companies would be keen to get into. This is a, an area where you really have to be very serious about this and invest significant time and money and have people with the knowledge to do this. Uh, you really can't just throw these things together and, and it works like magic. Uh, so Jeremy, welcome and please introduce yourself a bit more. Yes, uh, thank you, Glenn. And thank you, Andrew, for, for having me. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeremy Grinke. I'm the director of production here at the brewery. Uh, we're actually located in Orange County, California. So not San Diego, but not too far off. Uh, and there's some great beer made in San Diego. So not to, not to slight those guys down there, but we're doing some really special stuff here in Orange County. Um, as Glenn mentioned, uh, I did start my alcohol career uh, in the wine business on the Central Coast. And I spent about eight years making wine, uh, several different wineries throughout the coast there. And 
found myself in, uh, you know, it was an incredible opportunity to come down here to Orange County and work with Patrick Brew, uh, who started the brewery. Um, and one of the things that really excited me about uh, what the brewery was doing was they were doing a lot of experimental beers uh, using wine grapes and 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 really from a love of wine drinking, uh, they wanted to play around with wine grapes. Uh, enter me uh, six years ago with a little bit of a, a skill set to do both. And um, you know what we have here tonight are, are several examples of as of what Glenn described as an actual process and not necessarily uh, you know just throwing grapes into beer and and waiting to see what happens. So we got some special uh, special stuff for you tonight. I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah, and before we, we get going, Jeremy, just briefly tell us about some of the things you might do during the week uh, and how you organize your time uh, and the schedule for, well, the brew schedule you would have. Yeah, so we are, uh, we are a, a small brewery. I, I think a lot of people think we're a very large brewery based on the number of beers we make and what you see out there in the market. Um, but we make about 180 different package beers a year. Uh, upwards of another 300 uh, beers that are pilot beers in our tap rooms and whatnot. Um, and so, you know, my, my day uh, starts with what's in process um, from, from packaging backwards. Um, so I don't really look at what we're brewing today. I look at what we're finishing today. Um, and then, you know, backwards through the tank system into brewing. Um, and then, you know, a big part of my responsibility here at the brewery is planning our beers for the year. So I'm very active uh, working through these spreadsheets, making sure that that we have, you know, the plan in place for uh, the communication strategy to our staff. So everybody knows what they're doing, why they're doing it, where they could find the recipe, uh, what kind of barrels it's going into. Um, we do a lot of barrel work here. So it's, it's quite often that our beers are going into barrel uh, and then a year later coming out of barrel. So we're touching that beer twice, um, you know, double, triple, quadruple labor on pretty much everything we do. Um, but, you know, I quite honestly will speak for the rest of our production staff. Uh, we wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, this is, this is what excites us. Uh, you know, there's, it, it, it's exciting to make a really clean lager. Um, and it truly is exciting. And it's, you, you get, uh, you get that gratification, you know, within, you know, five weeks or so here, the way we're doing it, but uh, you know, putting a beer away for two years and pulling it back out of barrel and, and tasting the, you know, what, what wood and time does to, uh, to our products is just as special. So really a, really a place that uh, if you want to, if you want to work at a beer playground, um, the brewery is, is definitely one of those places. Yes. I'm sure a lot of people, uh, certainly a lot of home brewers have this notion that things don't always go to plan <laughs> and you do Absolutely. plan the best you can, but things always sort of go astray uh, and can throw your schedules out and supply of raw materials and all that sort of stuff. It, it's not the romantic thing that a lot of people might think brewing or winemaking really is. It's really complicated business. Absolutely. Yeah. So thanks for that. Uh, that gives us some great background. And uh, I might just get you to briefly just touch on the three beers. I know we'll talk about them specifically, but let's just yeah. touch on those three briefly. Yeah. To that. So we have uh, three beers tonight that are, um, you know, in a lot of ways more similar to wine than they are beer. Um, and, and the reason I say that is in the order that we're going to drink them, we're going we're gonna to drink a, uh, a white, uh, what would, wouldn't be called a white beer, but if it was a wine, it would be called a white wine. So we have a Grenache Blanc and Viognier um, uh, beer that, that is truly fantastic and I can't wait to taste with you guys. Uh, following that, we have a, a Pinot Noir uh, product that is, um, you know, kind of uh, a native style fermentation and, and a little play on the natural wine uh, world that's, that's going on all around us right now. And then to finish it up, we're going to have a, uh, a really, really big, bold beer that's combining our uh, world famous Black Tuesday Imperial Stout and uh, the world famous uh, Cabernet Grapes coming out of Napa Valley. Um, so really, uh, quite a different, quite a, quite a play on, on these products. And we'll, we'll go from, you know, what, what is subtle to what is, uh, you know, with the, with the white, uh, to what is new, new school, younger, younger drinker with the, the natty style of Pinot Noir 
And then to the real uh, heavy hitter, you better you better have a ribeye handy uh, when you're drinking the last the last beer we have tonight. Yes, and we will talk about some food options as we go through the different beer styles because uh, people may be more familiar with matching beer, uh, wine and food. Uh, less people would be familiar with matching beer and food. So I think we'll bring all of it together tonight. Um, so we will have polls tonight. So for the attendees, there will be three polls as we go through the tasting of each beer. So you can fill those polls in. Uh, we're talking about flavours and aromas, what you can taste, what you can smell. Uh, and we'll just see the difference in how people perceive these beers and, and the different flavours and aromas that they're getting. So let's start with the very first one, the vine. Um, you can probably open that. Uh, where's my opener gone? Just here. You just want to talk us through this particular... I will. ...in detail and how you, you go about making this. Yeah, so this is actually a collaboration product with uh, a very accomplished winemaker in the San Inez Valley um, by the name of Andrew Murray. Um, and it's also a, also a mashup with uh, Chef Brooke Williamson, um, who is, you know, Top Chef fame and, and Food Network um, uh, star as well. Uh, anyway, two, two friends of ours and, and our love of Rhone style wines is what um, inspired this product. Um, but essentially the way we started this is we started this uh, trying to, to stay as close to uh, winemaking as we possibly could. So this beer, uh, again, you know, you're going to hear me use the term beer and wine. Um, I wouldn't say interchangeably, but I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use them a lot and <laughs> it's going to be a little bit weird. Uh, but that's what this product is. It's a little bit weird. Um, but essentially what we have here is we have a uh, Grenache Blanc and Viognier that was harvested uh, and pressed uh, in San Inez and then sent down to us as juice. So we sent it down in a refrigerated truck, uh, you know, to arrest fermentation. Uh, we brought this into our cellar. We brewed a Lambic style wort base, which is a, uh, you know, 60% malted barley, 40% of malted wheat. Uh, a little bit of aged hops uh, to uh, bring out some cheesiness and uh, you know some some interesting bitterness that will take a little bit of time and barrel to get through. Um, but the trick with this one is uh, we actually pitched this in stainless with um, a wine yeast, um, and it, it was a little bit of a gamble because you know there, there's a lot of different uh, sugar structures out there, and and wine yeast are uh, you know bred and designed to uh, ferment fructose and sucrose, um, which is a you know different sugar structure. So we gambled a little bit on whether we could actually get this to uh, ferment maltose, which we did. It's, it's dry. Um, this after fermentation went to a mix of French and American oak for about five months. And the reason that it did that was to um, you know kind of eat up and, and mellow some of that cheesiness that was coming from the aged hops. Um, you know, sour beer is something we make a lot here uh, at the brewery. We have a we have a sour facility called the Brewery Teru. Um, but one thing that we wanted to do here was was not have a uh, a sourness that was coming from the beer, but instead a natural wine acidity that was coming. Um, so I think that you know on this on this beer, um, you know, there, there's a couple aromatic things that that really um, jump out of the glass to me. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, the, those, those things are coming from the wine grapes. It's a very, you know, Lambic style wort um, is a very, it, it's a very empty and clean palate. It doesn't really have a lot going on with it. What the real star in Lambic beer production, um, you know, is the, the wild microbes. You know, that's what really drives flavor. Um, that's what drives, uh, you know, um, all the acidity, that's what drives uh, the aromatic structure. It's usually like, you know, the wild yeast that are going in there and creating some of your barnyardy um, sort of aromatic structure. So this one, you know, to me is void of any of that stuff. It's really a fresh fruit um, and, you know, a very, you know, it's driven by, it's driven by the Grenache Blanc, but really accentuated by the Viognier. Viognier as a grape um, and especially as a wine um, is very aromatic. Um, to the point where it's often used 
in uh, old world winemaking in a low percentage just to finish a red wine, uh, speaking mostly of like the hermitage wines of uh, the Northern Rhone. But Viognier is a very, very powerful grape. So, you know, we get that on the nose. And then I think the other big thing we get from this uh, is oak. It's not, it's not huge in the oak category, but you could definitely um, get it on that, on your nose. Um, so I think, you know, this is trying to stay as true to white wine making as possible. Um, and we haven't even tasted it yet. All, all I've done is talk about it at this point. So as I said, we have uh, a poll happening. Uh, so if our IT friends could launch that poll, um, I don't trust myself to be able to use that technology. Um, so we'll leave it open. Hopefully you have some of the beer to try. Uh, so please put in uh, what you're picking up in the aroma profile uh, of this beer. Um, so this beer has been, has been in bottle for about a year. Um, and one of the things that I think it's, uh, it's going through is it's going through this, um, you know, a little bit of this maturation period where it's, it's not, it's not as uh, bright and acid forward as you would expect it to be, but it's starting to be, you know, a little bit more uh, well-rounded and balanced on the palate. A lot of times when you, when you bottle um, not only beer young, barrel aged beer, but wine young, um, it, it goes through a bottle maturation process. And if you think about uh, wine packaging, um, you know, a cork is, is meant to breathe and it's meant to oxidize and it, it's meant to actually mature your, your, um, your wine and your product once you have it in your hand, as opposed to leaving it in the cellar and maturing. So I think that when, with this style of uh, beer making, um, I almost caught myself, I almost said wine making, but with this, this style of beer making, uh, I think it's really important to remember that you're not, you're not trying to make something weird. You're trying to make something the way you intended it to be. And through a lot of trial and error, um, you know, we, we have discovered that, uh, there are certain types of things that, that seem to work together. And, and for us, uh, when we talk white wines. Um, I think there's the Chardonnay uh, that works really well. And I think these Rhone varietals work extremely well for um, bringing out uh, what some might say would be natural beer flaws. But when they work in a hybrid product like this, it actually is, you know, something um, that what, what, how do you say it, Glenn, where the, the sum is more than the parts, you know, um, so I get like, there's another, another thing that's jumping out to me on this and I'm getting, I'm getting some green apple, which, you know, is, you know, oftentimes not, not the greatest thing to have in a beer unless it's stylistic. Um, but it's really jumping out at me. I think that's, that's this, that's this beer changing over time. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the yeast uh, contributing all those delicious esters. Yeah, absolutely. So We've been running the poll a few minutes now. I might end the poll um, and let's see what we've got. Um, and I'm going to share those results. So hopefully everyone can see those results. Yeah. So we've definitely got the, the, the fruit uh, being picked up by most of the people. Um, yep. Which is, is good. They're, they're, they're on top of that already. Yeah. Uh, so I think, it, you know, I think the honeysuckle is... Uh, you know, that's a descriptor that's often used to describe, uh, you know, aromatic structure in Viognier. Um, peach and stone fruit is often used as well for Viognier. It's also often used for the Grenache Blanc. Uh, vanilla, we're getting that from, from barrels. Uh, so that's your American oak uh, coming in there. And then the pear, you know, I think the pear is a good descriptor, but to me it's that it's that palm fruit, if you will. It's you know, it's, it's the the green apple pear sort of thing. So yeah, I think I'm, uh, I'm getting I'm getting more green apple. Um, yeah, but it's very well balanced. Um, so when you're putting a, a beer like this together, what are you thinking in terms of hopping rates? Oh, so so on this one, um, you know, we 
we, we play around a little bit with our Lambic style wart base. Um, and when I say that, um, you know, we do, we've been doing a wart base here that's inspired by Lambic beer, but isn't a turban mash. Um, and it isn't um, spontaneous in nature. In other words, we, we, we pitch our, our house sour culture to it. <clears throat> we've been making that, that beer for a lot of years, about 10 years, as a matter of fact. And we end up using it and blending it into a beer we make called Ruse which is an, an ode to the goose, if you will. But it, but again, it's not spontaneous, it's not turbid, and, and we're not trying to make uh, a Lambic beer in America. We're trying to make an American beer that's inspired by you know, the Lambic producers. Um, so on that beer, uh, we're anywhere, depending on the, the hops that we have at, at any given time, and we buy bales of, of hops for the year, um, we're in the three quarter a pound per, per barrel um, rate. Now, we started about five years ago to make a, a fully turbine mash, spontaneous, uh, you know, inoculated and real ode to a lambic. Uh, and with that one, we upped the hopping rate um, to about 1.1 pounds uh, per BBL. And that was strictly, uh, you know, to build those bitterness units into the beer so that we could age longer and, and actually go through that, um, you know, the the process of, of yeast and bugs eating that eating that really turbid mashed beer uh it, we we're going for the long haul there so we need those extra bitterness units there um but ideally uh it's beer specific and we, and we we pull it depending on where we're at um you know a lot of a lot of I, i've i've had a lot of fun you know recently doing some other weird things that aren't aren't necessarily um aged hops, but, but, you know, trying to get in the like 45 to 50 IBU for, um, antimicrobial, uh, properties within a sour brewery. So we have some, some different saisons that will, will make extremely bitter so that we can ride through eight months of aging without the possibility of it going sour. And basically we're pulling that beer, you know, right when the bitterness is, is dying down and when it's actually somewhat drinkable Yep, for a saison that is. I'm um, very much enjoying this, um, and I could just sit and talk about this all night, but look, we have to move on. Uh, I do have a couple of questions. Um, one from uh, an Aggie alum, uh, and David is asking about using lacto uh, or other souring methods on your beer wine hybrids. And I know you've touched on that a little bit already. Yeah, um, what, what exactly was the question? So what are your thoughts on using lactobacillus or other souring methods on your okay. beer wine hybrids? Well, um, that, that's a really good question. And, you know, when you're, when you're farming wine grapes, um, usually the way you're, you're looking at your pick window and when you want to pick is, is regulated by, by two things that you're analyzing throughout the, throughout the harvest window. And those two things are sugar and acidity. Um, as your uh, sugar goes up, you know, usually at a certain point, your acid will, will, will start to blow out on you, if you will, you start losing acid. Now in winemaking, that's a big deal. You want to be able to, you want to catch everything in harmony. I want the right acid structure and I want the right sugar level. I don't, I don't care about pushing the sugar to get ABV. I care about balance and I care about acid. Well, when you work in a sour brewery, it's really easy to make acid. So I'm not so, I'm not so concerned with the acidity in the grapes as much as I'm concerned with the um, sugar profile and the lack of or potential degradation of the actual skins. Because as the skins start to deteriorate, then you get into some acetobacter sort of issues, which is something you do want to stay away from. So if anybody ever offers you, you know, uh, grapes that birds got into or something, that's the thing you want to stay away from because it's really, really bad once the skins are broken. But um, we, we have several different types of beer we're going to share tonight and, and they're all different. Um, so in this beer, uh, there, there is a little bit um, of acidification that's going on in the barrel aging process. Uh, again, this is one of the reasons that that we use the aged hops. Uh, when we knew we wanted the bitterness to uh, thwart any oversouring, um, but we also knew that during the barrel aging time frame, um, you know, there is all those microbes in 
the grape juice that, that we fermented with this. So those are already uh, wild yeast. There's already um, lactobacillus bacteria. There's already pediococcus. There's all that stuff. So I have no doubt that had we aged this beer for three years, that this would be a complete and total acid bomb. But the idea with having this short aging period, the bitterness units that we did, fermenting in stainless, trying to control the fermentation, um, you know, using wine yeast, getting in fermentation done, getting the beer dry and getting it to barrel. All of that was done for the purpose of not having this beer go too acid forward. Now, sure. I, we've made some other examples in the past where, you know, that that wasn't thought about. Um, and so that's that's kind of why I was saying earlier that all, all of these products have taken years to develop uh, through you know, happy mistakes and uh, happy coincidences, if you will, and, and then a, a great amount of failure as well. Um, it's not it, it's not easy to make a good beer like this without making a few stinkers along the way. And that's, that's definitely happened. Um, and, you know, I feel good about admitting that too, because I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, owning your mistakes as, as a, as a maker, um, is really important, uh, because it shows your team that, that you're human and you're, you're a leader that's, that's humble enough to admit their mistakes. And it gives it all the much more power when you are successful and you get to tell your team that they did this, you know, like, thank God you guys saved me on this one. So, it, you know, um, and one of the things that I've learned as I've grown older is that, is that a, a good dose of humility um, will get you a long way and it'll actually um, pave the pathway for innovation as well. Yep. Yep. So maybe one more quick question from Dana uh, and it's for both of us, actually. Uh, how did we develop our palates? Uh, so it's a great yeah. question. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at that first, if cool. that's okay. Cool. Um, I had some advice from uh, one, one of my best friends who's a, who's a winemaker um, in Paso Robles. He has a, a brand called um, uh, Saint Liege and another brand called The Fabulist. Um, and when I was starting out and, and wanting to get into wine, um, the one thing he told me was to drink a lot of wine. You have to you have to challenge your palate in order to grow it. Like you're never if you're the kind of person that doesn't eat salad. Like I don't like salad. Well, then you'll never have a good palate because you you don't experience enough to to go into understanding what you like and what you don't like. So if you want to learn about Zinfandel, the way you learn about Zinfandel is you drink a lot of Zinfandel from Lodi, from you know, the foothills, from Paso, from that, wherever you can get it, you drink it. And you know, that's a good example because Zinfandel is often a, a kind of a gateway red wine for people, but you got to drink it to learn it. The same thing is true with beer. Like if you don't like sour beer, that's okay. Maybe you don't like sour beer, but odds are you probably haven't drank that much of it. Yeah. Odds are you took a sip of a glass and said you didn't like it. You didn't finish the glass because you know, that first sip and that last sip of a eight ounce glass of anything are, are two different, two different tastes, two different sensations. So, you know, that's my big advice is if you want to, if you want to learn about flavor and about how flavor affects your palate, then you need to really test your palate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I probably had similar experiences, um, mostly in the brewing industry, but, uh, I'm definitely on the side of, uh, more hoppy, uh, I'm given a given a choice of a lager and an ale. I'll probably take the ale first, and I'd say, can you make it more hoppy? Uh, and and I think that's probably a, a, a combination of the foods I like, um, and just how my underlying genetics, so to speak, and how I actually go about sensing food uh, and and flavors and aromas. Um, I've had a, a broken nose a couple of times, so sometimes my aroma sensors don't work especially well, um, but I like to think I'm pretty good on, on flavors. Uh, and I do like the more bitter, uh, more phenolic, uh, but not to the point where some of the phenolics start to taste a bit like an ashtray or a, or a, a bit of Dettol or Band-Aid. Um, but when, as you said, you drink a lot of it, you can pick those sorts of sometimes even subtle contributions of those compounds really easily. Um, yeah. 
So it, it's a, and I think actually palettes change over time as well. Um, well, they, I, I agree. I think they absolutely do. Um, you know, that you think about um, why, why you like that extra hoppiness, right? You like, you like bitterness and, and bitterness uh, as, you know, somebody my age and, and, and uh, even younger than me and older than me, uh, you know, that, that bitterness, one, once it starts to fade is the thing that makes us want another drink. Um, but that same bitterness is, is absolutely abhorrent to a child. You know, they're, they're the last thing they want is something bitter. So, yes, there's we all got memories yeah. of having to be force fed Brussels sprouts as kids. <laughs> we do need to move on, Jeremy. I'm looking Let's forward to, to this one as well. Um, yeah. So talk us through the Natty Noir and maybe even throw in how you come up with some of these interesting names. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, as I said earlier, when we started, uh, Natty Noir, as we have here, as you can see, it's a, it's in a clear bottle. It's a, it's a carbonated, you know, Pinot Noir inspired beer. Um, but again, this is supposed to be a play on the natural wine movement. Um, you know, so obviously a lot of, uh, a lot of the younger generation is drinking these natural wines and, you know, I, I can do a whole seminar just on what, what a natural wine is um, and what I think about them. Um, but ideally, you know, we came up with this product to, to kind of play into, you know, that space of, uh, you know, not only uh, what people are drinking, but what they respect about what they think they're drinking. And, and a lot of what that is, is you know, non-manipulation during the winemaking process. Um, so the idea there with natural wines is that they are, they are not pitched with conventional yeast. They are uh, spontaneous fermentations uh, based off of microculture uh, that's existing either in the vineyard or on the grapes themselves. Um, and so that's what we have here today. This is an example of uh, that style of, of you know, hybridized beer making and wine making that's basically taking that, that same style wort base that we used for the last beer. And instead of, you know, going on to processed um, grapes, uh, so in, in the last beer's case, you know, they were Grenache Blanc and Viognier that had been picked by the grower, pressed at a winery, and we received just the juice. On this, we received um, whole cluster of Pinot Noir grapes. Uh, when these grapes came in, we destemmed 50% of those grapes into a into an open top fermenter. The other 50% went in whole cluster, so no destemming, no anything. Um, and then we dumped the wort just on top of that and let it let it ferment natively and and through a spontaneous um, lag phase, if you will. You know, th this is a, a very uh, exclusive gamble that I've become <laughs> very good at letting happen. Um, you know, th there was a time here at the brewery where I would do this style of fermentation and, you know, two, three days later, there was no signs of fermentation and, you know, the quality manager is, you know, literally pulling their hair out, you know, like, what are you doing? You can't do this. And, um, you know, I'm kind of one of those guys. Who I was like, well, let's just trust the process. Like, and, you know, and then being told, well, you don't have a process. I'm like, well, no, I do. The, the process is let's see what happens, you know? Um, and lo and behold, you come in the next day and, and you got off gassing and you got grapes coming out of a tank and, you know, things are, things are going. Um, but that's an example of what we have here. Uh, you know, this, as I said, is, is that wort going on top of grapes, um, a native fermentation taking place. And then the interesting thing about this one is when it's done fermenting anyway, by the way, excuse me, let me backtrack. So while it's fermenting, we're treating this as a wine. So we're doing punch downs on, on the cap. We're uh, doing pump overs to get <laughs> bad oxygen into the fermentation. Like, like and by bad oxygen, I mean too much oxygen. I'm not saying like make yeast healthy. I'm talking about aerate the heck out of these grapes, you know, which is not a beer making technique. Um, all of that being said, once fermentation's over, we pull all the free run. Free run is a wine making term for the juice, you know, that you can get out without trying really hard. We pull all of that out and then we put all the grapes through a press. So we have a big, you know, not a big, big for a brewery, tiny for a winery, but we have a nice pneumatic um, 
press that we use and we could fit about a ton of must into it. So that's what we did here and we press this and then as we're pressing it right all of that juice is falling by gravity into an open pan hitting oxygen like all this stuff that's not good for beer making. Then you take all of that we take the free run and the pressed run blend those back together and then it goes to barrel for about six months and oxidizes more and you know this is this is a barrel barrel technique but ideally one of the things about Pinot Noir um, and you know Glenn I, I'm not sure you know how, how up to date you are in Pinot Noir but Andrew certainly knows that you know a Pinot Noir smells like a Pinot Noir and there's no mistaking it um, and if your Pinot Noir doesn't smell like Pinot Noir then there's something wrong with it it's just it's just one of those red grapes that has an aromatic structure that I you know I I've been able to identify that from three feet away sometimes you know um, and, and I don't care if it's a if it's a new world or old world, you know, wine, if it's heavily extracted, like some young Californian winemaker, or if it's a, you know, a French classic, they have an aromatic structure. Yep. So yep. this, this one has it. It's you very know. good. It yeah. is very good. So we'll might launch our second poll uh, and hopefully people have, have uh, tasted or are tasting the Natty Noir. Um, so here we go with the poll. Again, there's some options for you, and it is still all about aroma. What are people picking up? Uh, there was a couple of things I picked up as soon as I opened the bottle. As soon as those aromas escaped, I picked some things up. Oh. Okay, so yeah. people come on. Um, I think uh, one, of the things, one of these things about this one too is it's, you know, as you taste it, it's, it's very light in body. Um, it's actually lighter in body than, than the, the white one we just, we just had 10 minutes ago, you know. And I think that's uh, quite a surprising uh, part about this. Uh, I think a lot of times you think, you know, red wines and, and that they're heavy, you know, um, and that's not always the case. I think this is a good example of you know what, man, I think it's a great example of what, <laughs> what a real conundrum of a, of a beer wine could be. Um, because I think if there ever was uh, a product to fool somebody into thinking it was a wine, uh, th this would be the one using subtlety to do that. A lot of times you can go big and aggressive and bold and, and fool people into something. But when you try to do it with a little hand of subtlety, it's it's actually quite impressive. Um, so what type of barrels is this one aged in? So this one is aged in uh, neutral uh, French oak punchins. So a punchin is a you know, 132 gallon or 500 liter barrel. Um, I find that, uh, that, you know, honestly, I find that uh, beer picks up oak a lot easier than wine does. Uh, and, and Glenn, I don't know if you know the science behind that, but there, there's something there because you, what, what a winery would call a neutral barrel and the oak that you can get out of it in beer is, are two different things, uh, two different stories there. But these really are about 10 year old, uh, French oak punchins that are truly neutral. So there shouldn't be much oak coming through at all. Uh, and the design for that was to preserve a lot of these fresh fruit and, um, aromatic structures you know and not trying not to cover those things up yeah well we've um we have some interesting results for the poll um oh wow i'll end that now i'm not sure you can see that at the moment jeremy but i'll i think we've had we've had nearly three minutes um so we'll end that and i'll share those results oh yeah that's that's it right yeah i mean that is you know that is uh, that that's proof in the pudding right there, as as I would say. That is that is showing you that um, that people are getting the Pinot. Um, I I don't think you know the one the one answer there of vinegar. That's not wrong. That's not wrong at all. I mean, this is a wild product. Um, you know, someday, you know, if you hold on to this bottle long enough, it will be vinegar. You know, so <laughs> um, so it, it I I get that. Um, 
Yeah, but I think it's, I think if anything, this, this beer is showing, showing really, really well. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's always a proud moment as a, as a beer or a winemaker to open something up and, and, to, and to notice that it hasn't changed and or degraded in any way. So I think this thing is drinking really, really well right now. And, um, you know, again, like I said earlier, it's a credit to the team uh, of guys, you know, that guys and gals that have, that have helped me make these uh, throughout the years. I think that one of the things that's really cool about our brewery is that, you know, every year during harvest time, it's, uh, it, it's like a bunch of kids in a candy store. Like everybody wants to come touch the grapes, you know, uh, everybody wants to get their feet in there if we're, if we're doing that sort of, uh, you know, foot stomping or whatnot, which we do do on occasion, just to, just as a morale builder and a cultural tool, um, just getting, you know, from the marketing folks to the tasting room folks, just getting everybody involved in the process of making something. It's actually pretty fun. Yeah. Um, I'll get Dana's question first. Uh, over the past year or so, have you seen a shift in your customer preferences or your customers' preferences? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I, I think we, I think we constantly see that. Um, you know, the brewery has been around for 13 years now, and uh, through that 13 years, uh, you know, we probably have went through five different customer bases. You know, where people get really into craft beer and, and, and want to really support your brewery and, and really want to drink your beers, you know, and they might be, I mean, they might be 27, they might be 37, they might be 47, but they also might be getting married and having a family they might be buying their first house. They might be doing a lot of different things. So, you know, they, they come and they go to some degree. And then I think there's the competition factor too. I mean, you know, there's, there's just a ton of breweries out there now. And so, you know, everybody's going to try something new all the time. I think that one thing we do here at the brewery with, you know, the amount of beers we make, you know, we release 15 new beers a month. Um, we're constantly uh, trying to get something new to people's hands. And, you know, we've had some, um, some really good success with some, some of these types of, of beers, but they're not for everybody. There's a special, you know, customer that wants to try something like this. And there's even a more special customer that absolutely loves this kind of stuff. So, you know, but they're, you got to find them. <clears throat> we got to, we got to find those customers and, and that's not so easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as these customers uh, change and as, as we find out what they want, um, I'm also changing, you know, I don't, I don't drink quite the amount of wine I used to drink at home. Um, and when I do, I'm drinking different products that I never would have thought I would drink. You know, um, you know, I remember being a kid in the eighties and Bartles and James was a big, a big thing and wine coolers. And, you know, I, I never thought I would enjoy a wine cooler, but you know what I find myself doing kind of like a wine cooler, you know, I kind of like, you know, I kind of think a beer, a beer like this Natty Noir would, tastes pretty good over some ice cubes, you know, like those are things that I never, you know, would have done before. Um, but we all change and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of into this, uh, you know, into this like wine spritzer thing. And I've been doing some beer spritzers and some, you know, mashups of, uh, fruit and, you mm -hmm. know, messing around with, uh, you know, doing seltzers that are like 49%, uh, fruit juice. You know, so like a hybrid wine seltzer, if you will. Um, and we were doing all that stuff on the pilot scale, but you know, those things are are pleasant and pleasing and and easy to drink and they're fun. And you know, so I think, you know, just kind of keeping um, keeping that ability to change and innovate at all times is is really, you know, not only um, what makes me love what I do, but it it really is like the heart and soul of this brewery that I work at. Well, I think that speaks to the industry as a whole. Um, you know, when I was growing up and and go to the pub with my dad, um, they were drinking some standard lagers uh, in Australia, and they weren't terribly advent adventurous then. Um, and the odd bitter ale, uh, which wasn't terribly bitter, um, and occasionally you had a stout. And there weren't a lot of options. Right. Uh, and I think we certainly have a a new generation of, of consumers, uh, we won't say drinkers, of consumers, uh, sure. because that's what they do, they consume. Um, and they might have two pathways. One, they will always have one or two 
drinks they like and they go back to, but then they say, I want to try something new. And this is where the industry is trying to meet some of that interest and, and the diversity that these consumers are looking for. Um, yeah, you're and, right. and you do have to be on top of your game there. So I was going to ask you about, uh, and I meant to ask in the first beer, a couple of food options with B before we get into our last one, because I know what the last one is about. And uh, sure, I know sure. my yeah. food options with the yeah. last one. So I think, you know, for me, I think, uh, you know, especially tasting these again right now, you know, it always always helps bring this stuff to the front of mind. But with the first one we had, the vine, um, is actually a pretty funky experience. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of fruit on the nose. Um, you know, there's a little bit of cheesiness in there. I, I'm I'm still getting a little bit of cheesiness, but I don't I don't think anybody chose that as a descriptor on the aromatic structure. But um, it's it's also very full bodied. So to me, uh, that with that acidity, um, I like you know I like you know stinky farm farm cheeses and and fat you know cheeses that have a lot of fat and a lot of cream. I think that acidity helps cut through that. Um, with the Pinot Noir, uh, it's it's such a, a fruit bomb right now that um, I wouldn't I wouldn't do anything that that didn't accentuate that more. So I would almost on that one go with like go with fresh fruit, go with strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, like that kind of thing. Um, I think it would actually work really really well. Um, but as I always say, and and this isn't this isn't me trying to be funny um, at all, but you know, I think, you know, beer and wine is best paired with other people. You know, I think that there's something about, um, you know, sharing an experience with somebody, um, you know, having a conversation after work or, you know, unwinding on a Saturday as you barbecue. Uh, there's something about camaraderie and fellowship uh, that alcohol seems to uh, be the magic elixir for. Yeah, and I, I think uh, over the last two years, we're overdue some celebrations and sitting around with friends and, and talking about our experiences for the last 12 months. And this is some certainly some fine beer that we could be doing that with. Um, one more question from David. Um, he says, when he introduces people to the beer grape hybrids, he will show them uh, goes as, as red, uh, red. Yeah. What first beer of yours do you recommend for friends that like both beer and wine? So do you have a suggestion for a first beer of yours? The, the Mine. Beer? Yeah. Well, I, I think he picked a good one. We have a beer in distribution that's called Goes as a Red. Um, it's in a four pack. You can buy it at BevMo and, and uh, Total Wine and these kind of places. Um, you know, what's... What's interesting in that beer is, you know, there was, you know, and still going, but there's a big rosé trend over the last, you know, four to five years here. Um, and a lot of breweries have been trying to, you know, make a rosé inspired beer, but most of them, you know, end up using hibiscus and, and some other berry or whatnot. Um, we actually use Syrah uh, grapes for ours, um, but, you know, it, it is very, you know, it's a goes. Uh, goes uh depending on how 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 we need to pronounce it and I'm, the jury's still out for me but ideally um it's a goes it's like five a little over five percent it's it's red it has syrah on it but it's not it's not a challenging beer and i think that's when you know when you want to start somebody out on something you don't always want to challenge them you want to you want to intrigue them and interest them and lead them down the pathway to something great so I think that's a very accessible beer. You don't have to be a member of ours or break the bank to get it. Um, and I think the beer drinks really, really well. Yep, thank you very much. I'm sure David agrees with you on that one. Yeah. Um, so we do have to carry on and um, I have been looking forward to this one the most. Um, Great. I do love a stout. So this one, um, hopefully people are trying to open this with a corkscrew and not a, a bottle opener. Because yeah. Definitely not a crown seal. This is a corked sure. product. So, so this uh, is a... Hopefully people opened it early uh, and it's not so it gives it a chance to breathe. Um, um, yeah. So this one is, as I mentioned earlier, this is a, a blend of, of a couple famous things. Um, you know, I would say the Cabernet, so I'll go on grape and Napa Valley is probably a little more famous than our Black Tuesday Imperial Stout, but they both are famous. Um, so we make a beer here at the brewery called Black Tuesday. Um, we release it every October 
And it's a big bourbon barrel aged stout that usually is anywhere between 18 and a half percent to uh, 20% ABV. So a really, really big, big stout uh, aged in bourbon barrels. This beer has very little to do with Black Tuesday is, as it's not bourbon barrel aged, but what it is is, is that Black Tuesday wort stream. Um, so we harvest Napa Valley grapes, um, we destem them, we put them into closed top tanks. So this is a clean beer, which is very different than the last two beers we had. The last two beers we had are wild. Um, this beer is clean in the fact that we make it in our clean cellar. We try to keep it clean. We try to, we try to make sure that we inhibit as much um, you know, bacterial and wild native sort of uh, fermentation as we can. Um, but it starts by basically bringing the grapes in destemmed. Then we do a cold maceration for three to four days, depending on the smell of the grapes actually. So I'll go in every morning and kind of waft some, some air above the grapes up. And if I'm starting to smell, you know, what is a precursor to an off flavor, that's when I'm like, let's go. So that day we brew the wort, we put the wort into the grape must, and then we over pitch that with our um, house Belgian uh, yeast that we use on, on all of our Belgian style beers. And it's a very, very aggressive yeast that will ferment up to 19 and a half percent, which is our Black Tuesday. So we know that we're going to get aggressive. We know that we're going to ferment to 100 percent dry. And the reason that we're trying to do that is we're trying to inhibit any opportunity of anything else to take over. So once that's done, we treat that the same way we treated the Natty Noir. It goes through a wine press, uh, goes through all of that. And then the difference with this one is that we actually invest in some really nice barrels. So we use 100% uh, new French oak for this, and we only buy punchins for that. So 500 liter new French oak punchins for this beer. And the great thing about that is once we use those barrels one time in our clean program, they go to our wild program uh, and get used there. And so that's a really good way. Most wild programs don't spend money on wood. It's like you get the cheapest barrels you can get. This is an opportunity for us to get some really great wood into the wild program. Um, but all that being said, you can tell by the color uh, that this is a purple stout. So, so it's got all the inkiness you know, of color from the grape skins, but then again, all the blackness of a stout. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it smells like a sawmill, right? It's just a hot, it's just oak, oak, oak. Um, so it's got all, yeah, it's got all of that um, oak flavor to it or oak aromatics, I'm sorry. And it's a mouthful. It's an absolute mouthful. Yeah. And I'd have to ask you about the, the combination of malts you're using in your stout production. Um, I'm getting a lot of late chocolate, um, yep. something like that. Um, it's really late. Everything else is washed over. And then there's just this late stout, uh, dark chocolate, dark malt. Yeah, so this is kind of our, our kitchen sink of malt, if you will. Um, I don't have the malt bill in front of me. I don't have the, that page up, but it's... It's, it's very it's, good. It's a monster and it's, it's built to last. So this is um, every, every ounce of this beer, every, every last detail to the packaging. Um, you know, Glenn can tell you, this is a big, heavy bottle. This is a 1200 gram bottle. So it's a three pound bottle. Um, you know, if, if this is a wine, you wouldn't expect, you know, for it to be priced under $200. It has that feel to it. It's bringing that power and everything in the bottle is, is bringing that as well. And when I say it's built to last, I mean, I, this thing is going to age three or four years before it starts to mellow on the oak and before it starts to mellow on some of the other flavors that are going on here. Um, but I think it, it's, it's great for any of those occasions. You want to blow somebody away with something that's over the top. It's ready to go right now. If you want to take a, an excursion to subtlety, like who knows how long that's going to take. And I think that's what makes it really, really weird and really impactful and, and really, uh, an appropriate bookend to the rest of the product. So like, you can't go further than this. I mean, I've tried, I just did a, a, a beer we released called Portified, which is kind of a, a reverse portification, if you will, where we just kept aging something. 
and evaporating it so that it got higher in alcohol. But as it was approaching 22%, we would back sweeten it with grape sugar or, or grape juice. Mm -hmm. So we would keep, you know, playing with the evaporation game and it's really, really cool. But this beer, I mean. Yep. Let's launch the poll. So our friends in IT, oh, he's on, the, he's on it quick. Um, so there we go. So hopefully people are still hanging in uh, and you've started to taste this delicious uh, stout Cabernet combination. Um, some interesting descriptors there. This is more about mouthfeel uh, and flavor, Ra definitely not aroma. Um, what food might you wanna pair with this? Yeah, for this one, I, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I, I think, you know, just to stay true with the, the Cabernet um, portion of this, this is a red meat um, item for me. This, that's what this is. This will also make a really cool uh, reduction um, sauce for, believe it or not, ice cream. I think it would work really well. Mm. Mm. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a real powerhouse and it, it's, um, God, every time I taste it, it's just a conundrum. Yep. It is good. It is very good. All that Cabernet early, and then there's just that late residual sort of roasted barley, roasted malt. Yeah, it finishes like a beer for sure. There's no doubt. Like it, it finishes like a like a still stout, which if you know, stout can be really, really good, a hundred percent still, believe it or not. Um, we've done it a couple times here on purpose, I should say, because sometimes you don't do that on purpose. But um, I think I think stout is is uh, something that can show show really, really, really well. And sometimes with a little bit too much carbonation, you kind of ruin the body of a stout. So mm, absolutely. Yeah, I think it works really well for this. Absolutely. And, and there are, you know, various differences in stouts too. So stout often gets categorized as just stout, but there's so many degrees in stout. Um, very true. And what you should do with those. Okay, so I think most folks have, have contributed to the poll. We'll share those results. So this is about mouthfeel. Uh, That's and great. most people are feeling a silky mouthfeel. Uh, yeah. Some little, little bit of dryness and a little bit of tannic. Yeah, well, it is extremely tannic, right? There's, there's a couple things going on there. That's not only the the fresh and new oak, but it's also those you know Cabernet grape skins. It is very dry. That is absolutely by design. Um, silky. I'm getting that too. It's got a mouthfeel. It's got a thickness to it, and grippy as well. I think that's you know a very very tannic tannic type of thing, and it's it's got that little bit of a bite. I'm absolutely pleased to, to, that nobody said it's rough. Yes, <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> I'd want to know if somebody said they felt it was rough. I'd want to know <laughs> what they were perceiving with that. There's, sure. For me, it's it's could never sort of be described as rough. It is smooth, and it gives that residual total mouthfeel. Yeah, I think it's uh, it, it's quite a it's quite a quite a beer and quite a quite a mashup, if you will. Um, and, you know, the last thing I would add on this, on this beer, Glenn, and, and I, I mentioned this to you and Andrew when we uh, chatted um, last week is, you know, getting, getting um, Cabernet out of Napa to throw into your beer um, and any kind of real quantity is very, very difficult thing to do. Um, they are very uh, protective of their grapes and where they're going, who's using them, why they're using them uh you know who are, are you going to talk about using them so anyway I, the one thing i wanted to add is that this is actually uh, a collaboration with the erosion wine company in napa and erosion wine company is owned by patrick Rue, who who started the brewery um as, and he's still our founder but he's he's moved up to napa and started a winery about two years ago so uh he's he's been excellent helping us source uh you know the grapes that we that we need for these projects. Sure. 
Well, uh, there, no more questions have come in, but you're certainly welcome to throw in a last question, everyone. Um, I, I think this has been a fabulous uh, exchange as well as an opportunity um, to taste some beer, wine, wine, beers, uh, right. <laughs> some hybrids. Right. Some hybrids. Uh, and it really, as I said at the start, uh, our industry, um, while traditionally seen as very conservative, I think the craft industry and the craft brewing industry in America is seen around the world uh, as, as a way to innovate and challenge old paradigms. And I think Jeremy and, and Darren, who was going to join us tonight, but he, he couldn't make it. Um, Darren is an alum from UC program, uh, the brewing program. So uh, Jeremy and Darren and the team are doing an amazing thing down there at the brewery. Uh, and it's been great to have you with us uh, for this. And I, I think it's sort of uh, bodes well for a, a revisit in 12 months time to see what's new at the brewery. Um, yep. I'd be so, happy, happy to work with you guys anytime you want. It's always a pleasure, um, Glenn. Thank you. That sounds great, Jeremy. And I see Andrew's joined us. So that's our cue to hand over to Andrew. So I, I just want to thank Jeremy again uh, and the whole team at the brewery. Uh, and we look forward to working you with, with you in the future. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you both very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Over to you, Andrew. Well, I <clears throat> want to add my thanks. This has been um, a revelation to say the least. Uh, I have to admit when Glenn proposed this, I was more than skeptical. <laughs> But uh, no, these, these uh, you know, Glenn, you and I have to come up with a word for this. I don't know, we need, we need a word to describe these products, but um, you know, these, these have, uh, and obviously this has taken some time, melded, I would say the good qualities of both of these beverages in some sneaky way. Um, I'm sure that Jeremy has, has had some experiences <laughs> melded the downsides in both ways of both products, but you know these have obviously uh, benefited from your expertise. So um, <clears throat> I did want to call out your use of 500 liter punchins as a as a you know an expert uh, call on that to to limit the oakiness. Sure. And then um, I do want to get back to you on that. That the product that didn't work out where you were adding syrup or I would say grape concentrate, right? Yeah. To to continue a fermentation that's a actually two thousand year old or no maybe three thousand year old uh, technology that's been rediscovered many times. Adding grape concentrate to a fermentation to keep it moving, right? <clears throat> so I guess I better close up. Um, Thank you all for, for being here, and I'll move on to let our audience know about upcoming events. Um, the uh, recording will be available on our website next week, so if you can encourage your friends who uh, weren't able to attend to watch this and, and catch up on this uh, really exciting uh, innovation here we've got here tonight. Uh, please fill out the survey on your way out. We're currently planning our summer and fall program, so we'll carefully consider your input. And finally, in closing, I'd like to thank our RMI friends for their support, <clears throat> support of this event, and welcome you to join our friends program. Uh, in addition, I'd like to encourage you to follow us on Facebook so you can keep up on you know upcoming events and so on and other happenings on campus. And finally, good night.